Hi everybody and welcome to our uh, lecture on the subtitle zone. So we just finished the intertidal zone and the estuaries and now we're actually moving below the waterline so that we are always submerged and that is the subtitle zone. Before we get to the subtitle zone I will like to show you guys a little drawing. Normally something this is I would do on the board. Obviously I can't do that so um, I'm going to tape it to my laptop real quick and then we're going to talk about that. So give me one second and um, I will be right back. Okay, so I included a little snippet, a little screenshot of this picture. So if you can't see it really well right here, don't worry about it. I'm going to have like a still shot for you guys if I haven't already put that up yet. So um, I'm going to use my handy dandy pointer. Yes, it is a chopstick. Um, but let's go ahead and get started with the beginning. I think I've already shown this to you guys, but um, just in case I haven't, we're going to do it again. So remember that we just finished and we were over here in the intertidal zone. Okay, so this would be like the intertidal zones, estuaries where the land is going to meet the ocean. So when we actually break off from the intertidal zone, now we're in the subtidal zone. So everything way out here below the waterline is gonna be considered the subtidal zone. Okay, so that's what you're gonna see right here. So if you're in the intertidal zone or anywhere with the tidal fluctuation, this is known as the littoral zone, L-I-T-T-O-R-A-L, -T -T I believe littoral zone and so basically this is anywhere where there's kind of tidal fluctuations you can have your estuaries it's basically where the land is meeting the shore okay as soon as you come down from here now you're going to be over the shelf remember the continental shelf that we talked about okay in the pacific it's really really short in the atlantic it's really really long which makes the atlantic a little bit warmer because the waters are shallower it can heat up right here the continental shelf and then warm those near shore waters. We don't have that. We pretty much have a very short continental shelf and then it drops off real quick. The area over the continental shelf here, anywhere in this little water area right here is going to be known as the neuritic zone. Remember neuritic is over the continental shelf. Okay. Once we actually come off the continental shelf and it starts to slope down, this is known as the continental break or essentially it's the end of the continent. So for here in North America, this is the end of North America where it drops off and now we just have ocean, right? This would just be ocean floor. No more continent, no more land, deep, deep water, typically. Um, so the continental break leads to the continental slope. The slope is going all the way down here. Once you hit the very, very bottom, this little, this little curve right here, that's the continental rise. If, think of it, if we were coming this way, Right, we would hit the, from the abyssal plane, remember the flat zone way here, from the abyssal plane we would start to rise up, that's the continental rise, the start of the continent. Okay, so we have this continental slope going up, 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 continental shelf where it's kind of leveling off, and then boom, we have the continent itself. Okay, so this is all part of the continent. Once you leave the continent, or whatever continent you're talking about, right, you basically drop down here and now you're in the abyssal plane. The deep sea floor that's all over the entire planet that's very, very deep and just kind of like flat, that's known as the abyssal plane, right? It's the plains of the abyss. The abyss means very, very deep. The plains mean, again, just flat. Okay, so you're going along the abyssal plains here. If you have some underwater ridges, there are underwater ridges. In fact, there's underwater mountain ranges as well. So these are usually um, underwater ridges, um, some kind of tectonic plates shifting and pushing upwards. That's kind of thing that's going on here. Um, if you have a very tall one, it is known as a sea mound. Um, sea mounds are great because you're now in the middle of the ocean where there's not a lot of structure. You have all of this benthos, right? All of this benthic area, meaning bottom area. It's not just flat. Now we increase complexity. So anytime you're going to have underwater ridges or you're going to have sea mounds, you're going to have a higher species diversity there because, again, more nooks, more little uh, niches and cracks and crevices and stuff that you can live in. Uh, if the sea mound goes up, 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 and actually pierces the surface of the water, now you have an island. Typically, underwater ridges, sea mounds, all of that, it's volcanic activity. So you can think of like the Hawaiian Islands. So Kauai is actually the oldest of all the islands. Okay, that's the one at the very, very top. And then you have another, I forget what they are, it's like Oahu and then Lahui and then the big one, right? The big island is still being formed. The big island erupted not too long ago. It was just a couple years ago where the big island was erupting for like weeks. It was just spewing out all this lava. Okay, that's essentially how all islands were formed. What you do is you have this buildup of this mag, um, basically magma and lava and all this kind of like stuff that's coming up from the Earth's crust. And it builds and it builds and it builds and it builds. And that's what it takes you from the little ridges to the sea mounds. 
And then if they really build nice and super big, then they become islands. Okay, so like um, what's happening with the Hawaiian islands is they're kind of like in a string, like, like in those little dots. And that's because the earth is shifting, right? Those platonic, tectonic plates are shifting. So as they shift, you had a hot spot coming up. It's, it's called a hot spot or um, volcanic plume, I believe it is. It's essentially just like bubbling up of this magma and this lava and stuff coming from the earth's core. So as it keeps coming up, as the earth's crust shifts, it's like poking little islands, poking little islands, poking little islands every time it becomes active. And that's why the Hawaiian islands are actually in a string. They weren't one big island that kind of broke off like Pangea, right? When we all the continents were one big massive supercontinent and then they started breaking off because of the tectonic shape, uh, plates were shifting. This is kind of like they're moving and as they're moving, you're gonna have these little hot spots, these little volcanic islands that are actually formed. So pretty cool stuff. So again, if it actually pierces the surface, it's going to be an island. Um, just a reminder, in our pelagic zone, it's in our open ocean zones, right? We're here in the oceanic zone or the pelagic zone. Okay, the very, very top is going to be the epipelagic, followed by the mesopelagic, the bathypelagic, the abyssopelagic, and then when you're all the way down in here, right, in the deep sea trench, it's known as the hadal zone, H-A-D-A-L, hadal, or hadal zone or hadopelagic, you can see it sometimes like that. Sometimes you're in the very deep crevice and you're just talking about the ocean right there. So that'd be hadopelagic or hadal zone, anything like that. Um, so these are our subtitle zones that we're gonna be talking about. We're gonna focus our deep sea lectures later. We're gonna do an open water lecture um, coming up as well. But right now we're talking about some typical subtitle areas. We're really gonna be focusing over here on top of the continental shelf. So with that, I'm gonna get us back to our PowerPoint. All right, so we are back with our uh, subtitle zone. We're going to be moving along. So we've described the continental shelf and what it means and all the different continental slopes and zones. So I'm just gonna kind of breeze through this really quick. Um, but essentially it's the edge of our continent. So it's our edge of our continent before it starts breaking off. So this right here would be the continental slope, uh, shelf before we reach the continental slope. Um, it's basically anything from the lowest low tide to the shelf break, so anything just below the intertidal zone to right before you hit that deep, deep drop off right here. That's all still considered the continental shelf. Um, normally it's pretty gradual, so that's why it is called a shelf. Uh, most people think of our ocean as soon as you get in the ocean, it kind of is a steady slope like that. Not really. It actually, it's pretty slow and steady for a really long time if you're in the Atlantic, not so long if you're in the Pacific. And then it's like a steep drop off. That's where it really gets really, really deep really quickly. Now it depends, it does depend on where you are. Um, I've definitely dove some places right off our California coast where there's almost no shelf. It's essentially just, right? Intertidal to deep right away. Um, those are some underwater canyons, some deeper areas right there. Those are actually pretty rare. We usually do have a decent sized continental shelf right off of our coast. Um, like I said, in the Atlantic, it's always going to be much larger. And this is on average, right? So we're not talking about every single spot in the Atlantic is larger than every single spot in the Pacific. But in general, the Atlantic has a much larger, much wider continental shelf than we do. And that's something we talked about with the estuaries. Um, you know, the longer your continental shelf is, the more likely you are to get things like estuaries because you're going to get that gradual runoff instead of that steep slope. Uh, um, yeah. Um, so the average shelf uh, break, sorry, uh, shelf, yeah, the average shelf break is around 450 feet or 490 feet. Um, so that's not really that deep if you think about it. 500 feet is not that deep in the ocean that, you know, goes really, really, really deep. Um, so um, again, that's, a, that's an average between both coasts. Um, when it comes to the width of the continental shelf, Right, we go anywhere from 0.6, which is not very far, that's less than a mile. That's a few blocks, technically. Um, and then it drops off. Or on the Atlantic side, you can get up to 480 miles. 480 miles! That's more than here to San Francisco. Here to Sacramento. That's only like 360 miles or 380 miles, something like that. So you're talking about a really long way. It also makes fishing very difficult on... Um, the continental shelf if you're trying to get to those deeper water species. So if you're in the Atlantic and you want those pelagic species like the bluefin tuna and, and the billfish and stuff like that, um, you sometimes have to go over 400 miles just to get to that deeper water. Here in California, 
I can tell you that especially here in LA, it takes maybe two or three miles and then you're in these deep, deep sea pockets. And luckily for us in our channel, the channel, you know, the California channel right here, like the Channel Islands, um, that channel actually has these really deep water pockets. So luckily for us here in California, especially Southern California, we actually have a very high species diversity. Because we have the shallow waters, we have warmer waters coming from Mexico, we have the colder waters coming from up north, and we have these deep sea pockets that are right offshore, which is why you can see things like whales and stuff basically from your, you know, any cliff or anything like that, like Santa Monica, you can see whales passing by because we don't have a very long or sorry, a very wide continental shelf. Unlike the Atlantic, they have to go way far out to get there. Uh, but they do have more continental shelf and that's where a lot of that primary productivity is happening. Okay, if we're, if we're about 450 feet, light still penetrates there, right? We're not that 200 meters yet. So you still have a lot more algaes and stuff like that. You have a lot more primary productivity because you have a longer shelf. So it's kind of a trade-off. Do you want the diversity? Do you want, um, or do you want the um, primary productivity? So again, uh, okay. Um, again, the, the biggest species richness or the amount of species presence is always going to be over the continental shelf. Now, this is where um, these, these different debates and stuff come in because sometimes people are like, Oh, it's a really big ocean. All you have to do to find more fish and to find more food is just go farther out because it's just, you know, it's the same throughout. It is not the same throughout. The majority of life is only found over the continental shelf. We have a very short continental shelf. The Atlantic has a lot bigger one, but still, right? The majority of life in the ocean is going to be found. Well, I don't want to say the majority of life because, you know, you do have those pelagic species like the diatoms and the, you know, um, arrowworms and stuff like that, they are pelagic. They're holopelagic all the time anyway, so they don't need bottom. But diversity-wise, diversity-wise, you are talking about a much higher diversity over the continental shelf. So it's not necessarily species abundance, but can we eat copepods? No. Can we eat arrowworms? No. Right? So the mo most of the things that are going to be useful for humans are only going to be found in or, and over the continental shelf. So something to consider. Uh, also, it's really, really productive areas. We can't deep sea drill like 3,000, 5,000 meters down. I'm sure we're working on it because, you know, we're greedy humans like that. But we can do all those things on the continental shelf because it is relatively short or sorry, relatively shallow. Um, so that's where we're doing a lot of our oil drilling. That's where we're doing some mining. That's where we're doing these like underwater dredging. So it's kind of, you know, we're messing it up. That's the majority of where the life is. And now we're, we're, you know, humans are getting involved. And anytime humans get involved, it's not good. It's not good. So yeah, we are exploiting this continental shelf, which is kind of a bummer. Um, let's see. Oh, how much land do we actually own in the ocean? So if some of our continental shelves are only 0.6 of a mile, is that where it ends? Do we just end at the end of our continent? Or do we go farther out? So they basically said that um, in the 50s, they kind of said that, okay, we're going to allow drilling and, and harvesting of stuff like that 200 miles offshore of your country. So for the nearest 200 miles offshore, that is still owned by the United States. Now, it's not really like patrolled and stuff, especially once you get out past 200 miles. Yeah, you're talking international waters there. There's no really regulations. There's no laws because who's going to govern them? If you were to kill somebody in the middle of the ocean, what country would you be prosecuted under? Now, no, I'm not saying you should go out and kill someone in the middle of the ocean. Um, don't do that. <laughs> My teacher told me I could get away with murder. No. <laughs> um, um, but it really is kind of, that's basically what they're just saying is for harvesting wise, for um, exploitation wise, really, is we are able to harvest anything or exploit anything within 200 miles of our uh, shoreline. And that's including drilling and oil resources and stuff like that. So, yay. Um, again, because we have such high species diversity over the continental shelf, this is where the majority of the fishing happens. Fish need structure. Structure is not way out there. Yes, there are f species of fish that can deal with that. But again, it's like being in the intertidal zone. A lot more organisms can live near the continental shelf than they can in the open ocean. Just like a lot more organisms can live in the lower intertidal than the upper intertidal zone. It's just a harsh condition. It's a harsh condition living out in the pelagic. So that's why majority of these um, species, especially fishes, are going to be found over the continental shelf. They need food. They need the base of the food web, right? The food pyramid. 
Um, and that's going to be the primary productivity, which decreases once you go farther out. Yes, you have your phytoplankton, like your little floating animals, but if you're a fish that can't eat phytoplankton, that doesn't do you any good. So you have to stay above, um, near the continental shelf. Um, juveniles. So even those pelagic species, way, it's really tough to live in the pelagic. So a lot of the times they're going to be growing up near some kind of structure, near those algaes or those reefs, and then eventually kind of work their way out. Um, but continental shelves are amazing for juvenile species and not just fishes, uh, mammals too. So even, even your pelagic animals that live way out in the distance are probably going to be near closer to shore when they're younger because that's where the food is. And if they're small, it's a lot easier to get food, you know, there instead of chasing something down in the big open ocean if you're not big enough or fast enough. Um... Some organisms can only be on the continental shelf because they are photosynthetic, right? Things like corals, right? If they're doing, if they have that zooxanthellae inside of them and they need to do photosynthesis, that can only happen if they're in, you know, if they're in the light and they need structure. So yeah, you could be floating around in the plankton, but if you don't have structure, you're not going to be able to survive. So that's why things like cnidarians and things like um, um, sponges can only survive really closer to shore over the continental shelf because if you're way too far out, you're not going to have either the food that you need or the sunlight that you need. So some species are only ever found on the continental shelf. If you were to go out to the abyssal plain, you do not see in any of them anymore. Um, so yeah, again, not uniform. The ocean is not uniform whatsoever. There are definitely very distinct areas um, that some of these organisms can only live in. Now, temperature. Temperature is not going to fluctuate like it did in the estuaries or the intertidal zone, but it is still going to fluctuate. In the summer months, right, that sunlight is going to be able to penetrate down to the bottom of the continental shelf, and it's going to warm up the bottom, keeping that water over the continental shelf fairly, 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 um, fairly warm, Consider well, compared to the open ocean, the deep, deep ocean. So when you're talking about the deep ocean, you're not really going to get a lot of warming yeah you're gonna get that first epipelagic layer that's gonna be a little bit warmer but once you move down to the especially that aphotic zone you're talking about an average sea surface or an average sea temperature of three three degrees celsius that's practically freezing okay and that's because you're way out in the pelagic you don't have a lot of mixing you got nothing warming you up from the bottom unless you're way deep on the, like those hydrothermal vents and even then, that heat is going to dissipate. So the middle of the water column, which is the bulk of the ocean, is not going to have any kind of um, temperature fluctuations. It's going to be very common, um, consistent, consist very consistent. So again, in the upper intertidal, upper intertidal zone, the upper epipelagic zone, you're going to get a little uh, fluctuations when it comes to temperature, depending on summer, winter, stuff like that. Um, but in the meso and the bathy, you're going to get basically none, not nothing until you get to the abyssal. And that's only if you're near a hydrothermal vent. Um, so yeah, fluctuations happening over the continental shelf are going to be in the shallower areas, areas where they're being stirred up, like with wave action, um, anywhere on the continental shelf, those, those deep sea waves are going to be intensified because of the, um, presence of the bottom. So that is going to intensify waves, mixing, stuff like that. Um, but again, it's going to be very much more stable than the two ecosystems we've already learned about, the estuaries and the intertidal zone. Um, water turbulence, again, if you're in a shallow area of the continental shelf, yeah, you're going to have to deal with wave action, stuff like that, especially during storms. Um, you're on the continental shelf and a hurricane comes by, guess what? You're going to feel that hurricane, even if you're 300 meters down, uh, maybe not 300 meters down, 300 feet down. Um, in fact, the last time I went to Florida, I went to go dive the wreck of the Eagle, which is a boat that they sank many years ago um, as an artificial reef and a very popular uh, tourist destination for divers. And um, in, it was about a mile and a half from where it was after Irma came through, Hurricane Irma a couple of years ago. Hurricane Irma came through, moved it a mile and a half. We're talking about like a 90 foot metal battleship. Like it's huge. You can even Google it, the Eagle. Uh, it moved a mile and a half away and it broke in half so it was sitting upright uh it now is a mile and a half away and it is broken in half and on its side so that's the power of waves so even if you're say living 100 feet down and you're like ah, hurricanes and these big big storms can still do some damage to you so even though wave action is way down compared to like the intertidal zone you still have to worry about about that kind of thing 
Um, nutrients, again, waves are not necessarily a bad thing. Waves are coming in and they're, they're mixing up the sediment. That sediment has a lot of nutrients in it. Nutrients are great for things like algaes, right? They, they need them. They need to absorb them. We, and we eat those algaes and those plants and stuff like that. So nutrients are a good thing. That mixing is a good thing. Remember, we learned about upwelling and downwelling, right? Upwelling is coming up from the bottom, bringing in the, bringing up those nutrients that have sank to the bottom. That's good. Downwelling is a good thing because now you're bringing oxygen rich water gases from the top. You're bringing those down. So you get a lot of mixing. So you're going to have, um, you're going to have a good amount of mixing over the continental shelf. Not so much when we move to the deep sea. And that's something we're going to learn about, um, in the next lecture. Um, water clarity. So it's, um, if you are near shore, like if you're on the continental uh, shelf and you're near shore and you have that river runoff from the estuaries or you have a big storm or you have big waves rolling around, your water clarity is not going to be great. The farther you move away from land, the better it's going to be. Um, so yeah, so these, these nutrients are coming from these lands. They're coming from these autotrophs, meaning these plants and stuff, especially when they die, these nutrients are being replaced back into the ecosystem. Uh, decaying organisms, all that kind of stuff. So the nutrients are very, very important. Um, and again, they're most of the most of all the nutrients. If you're not a dead body, are coming from land. So the most amount of nutrients are going to be found near shore. The farther you go out, the water clarity is going to be better because you're not going to get that mixing, that sediment and stirring up and stuff like that. But you're going to have less nutrients, hence also less primary productivity. Okay, so just a reminder that these nutrients, they are coming from the soil mostly, um, or they're coming from the bottom. So again, if these nutrients have come from the river runoff, they've come into the ocean, and then they've settled down to the bottom, sometimes they can get lost if it's not, uh, the bottom's not being stirred up again. So there are organisms known as bioturbators out there. So turbation, or to turbate is again to stir something up, and a bioturbator would be something that's living that stirs up the bottom. So you can think of like whales rolling along the bottom to knock those barnacles off or um, stingrays like fluttering along the bottom, right? That's all going to stir up a little bit of those nutrients, which is really great. Um, other kind of bioturbators are going to be things like organisms that are actually eating those, um, those settled nutrients. So things like snails and clams and little worms and stuff that are actually kind of like taking in the soil, taking up those nutrients. Um, and being able to utilize them are also, you know, key factors in this environment. Um, the abundance of, oh, obviously, so anywhere near the bottom, because you're going to have things like structure, right? So you're going to have organisms. You're also going to have food sources. As those nutrients come in and they start to flutter down to the bottom, now you basically have a layer of food. So then things like clams and, and snails and stuff like that that are going to be crawling around the bottom, not clams. But you know what I mean, snails that are going to be crawling along the bottom can actually use the, that food source. So now you're going to have um, a more complex environment because you're going to have organisms who are going to eat those organisms who are eating the stuff that's settled along the bottom. So again, it's, that's kind of like the, the bottom of the food chain is, is sometimes this detritus or this, these floating nutrients that are just kind of floating in the water and then settling down to the bottom. Uh, okay, so now we're going to get into the types of communities that we have in the subtitle zone. So first up are going to be your soft bottom benthic. So imagine when we were talking about the soft sandy bottom in the intertidal zone, but you've just extended that farther outwards towards the, you know, deeper ocean. So this is going to be your soft sandy bottoms. Now I can tell you, this is the bulk of what is on the bottom of the ocean. And I've been to a lot of different places. It's mostly sand. It's mostly sand. It's mostly sediment. It's mostly some kind of soft bottom. Um, if you have it shallow enough, the water conditions are good enough, you're going to have seagrass beds. So that's the next type, type of ecosystem. Um, in the sandy bottoms, you really don't have a lot, right? You have almost no structure. So things like algae can't grow because they need something to hold on to. If you don't have algae, you don't have a lot of bulk of that primary productivity. So then again, you're not going to have that complex food web like you would um, elsewhere. You do have the nutrients that settle down to the bottom, so you are going to have a food web there, but it's going to be, um, it's going to limit you on the number of different species that can live there. Really, it's mostly going to be organisms like clams, worms, small crabs, and stuff like that, that are going to be crawling and surviving directly on that soft bottom sediment. Uh, seagrass beds get a little bit more complex because now we're adding that complexity. Again, it's going to be shallow, um, so that the seagrasses can actually do photosynthesis, but 
they are going to be able to attract more organisms because you're going to have more little structures. So those little fishes um, that we talked about in estuaries, little crabs, snails, worms, stuff like that, are also going to be there, but we're going to increase the number of species that we have because of the complexity of the seagrass bed itself. Kelp forest. Kelp forests need rocky bottoms. Okay, so the seagrass beds are going to do okay if they're a soft sandy bottom because the roots are really small and they're actually, they're, they are true roots because in uh, seagrass is an anthophyta, remember it's a true flowering plant. So their roots are going to actually be able to, to um, sustain and hold themselves in that soft sandy bottom. The kelp forests are going to need some kind of rocky bottom substrate. You have that big long stalk of kelp, it has to attach somewhere and it cannot attach because they're not true roots cannot attach to the soft sandy bottom, so you have to actually have a rocky bottom to get a kelp forest. Now, if you do have a rocky bottom and conditions are good and the algae is growing and you don't have things like too many urchins, you're going to get that nice, big, beautiful, blooming kelp forest that's actually going to be really great and very productive, a very, very healthy ecosystem. Um, but you're not going to get that if you don't have that hard bottom. Um, and that's, again, the, the last type is that hard bottom. It doesn't necessarily have to be a rocky bottom but it does have to be some kind of hard bottom. So usually when you're talking about soft bottom bed thicks, you're talking about things like that are just barren or with seagrass beds. And when you're talking about the hard bottom or the rocky bottom um, substrate, you're gonna be talking more of things like kelp forest and stuff like that. So the soft bottom bed thick again, dominates in the ocean. This is kind of like the big one. Most of the ocean is covered in the soft bottom um, benthos. And that's kind of unfortunate because we don't get a lot of those microhabitats and therefore we don't get a lot of big species diversity in these, um, in these soft bottom benthic areas. Uh, you do have your infaunal organisms as well as your epifaunal organisms and your myofauna. That's something that you don't get when it comes to a hard bottom, right? You're not going to get anything in faunal if it's a hard bottom because you can't bury and dig into that hard bottom. You will get some epifaunal organisms, but again, you won't get any myofauna if you're talking about the hard bottom. You only get these in the soft bottoms. Um, you don't get a lot of sessile organisms because there's nothing to hold on to, right? There's nothing to be sessile on. You can't be sessile on a little piece of sand. A little piece of sand could blow away and then you're no longer sessile. Um, yeah, so you do have a lot of different organisms um, and the variety is pretty good in these soft bottoms. But it's kind of limited, again, to the types of organisms that you're going to have. So you'll have several different crab species, but they're all still just crabs, right? You don't have crabs and barnacles and lobsters, right? Because they all need some kind of place to hide. Um, oh, and the distribution is very, very patchy when it comes to the soft sandy bottoms. Um, everybody's kind of spread out because there's a lot of area, right? There's not a lot of organisms there. So... There's usually a lot of area in between these organisms. So when you're diving them, it kind of looks like a barren desert, but just like a desert, you have to look closely and then you'll see, oh, there's an organism there and there and there and there. They're just kind of a little bit more spread out than they would be, say, in the inner tidal, where everybody's so jam-packed and so um, crazy close together. Um, let's see. So the larvae, so remember we were talking about um, gregarious aggregates or aggregate spawners? So these guys are basically ones who aggregate together or group together. And so they release pheromones and different chemicals that will attract other organisms of the same species. Um, and so the larval of a lot of these species kind of want to be where the adults are. They're almost like attracted to those kind of similar areas. Um, and this again is it's just all due to these chemical cues, depending on the species, they will let out different um, chemical cues to attract to these different areas. Um, important because if you're going to be a larvae and you're going to be developing, you kind of do want to be near an adult population because those are the ones you're potentially going to be mating with, right? If there's a bunch of you, then you guys have options to mate. If there's only just you drifting around the ocean by yourself, you don't really have a good chance of actually mating with someone. Um, lots of different myofaunas. Um, again, they're not really, myofaunas can't really be found anywhere else. They're really only found in soft sandy bottoms because they're essentially living in between the little grains of sand and silt or mud or whatever soft sandy bottom you're talking about. Um, so you can't get that in the hard rocky bottom area or even really in the open ocean because there's no sediment for them to hold onto, to grab onto. So these myofauna are really solely going to be in these soft sandy bottom areas. And they do have these little appendages that help them like grab onto the little sand, which I think I have here. No, not yet. So it's coming up. Um... All right, so a lot of these guys in the soft sandy sediment are going to be deposit feeder, feeders. Remember, deposit feeders are the ones who are eating sand and keeping the organics and then releasing the sand out of them. So like things like sea cucumbers. 
um, brittle stars, stuff like that. So they're eating, they're basically eating the sediments and then they're filtering out and taking the food part, not really filter feeder, sorry. They're um, sorting out and they're keeping the organics that they actually need to survive and then they're releasing the non-organics like the actual um, rocks and sediments and sand and stuff like that. Uh, again, we already talked about bioturbators stirring up the bottom. This is really, really great because again, if your sediments are going to be, if your nutrients are going to be settling along the bottom, as soon as they get covered with something else, those nutrients are essentially lost to the sediments. So bioturbators who come and kind of like stir up the bottom a little bit, kick back up those nutrients that may have been buried and that nobody got to yet. So this allows for more nutrients that were already there, but they become available again. And that's really important. So bioturbators are helping to churn up the bottom, to stir up the bottom. And that does some really, really good stuff for um, other organisms. And bioturbators are where we talked about stingrays and whales, but also like worms and clams. And basically anybody who's kind of like burrowing in is going to be stirring up a little bit and kind of mixing up that those, um, those layers that they're burying into. So those are all considered bioturbators. Here's an example of a bunch of um, soft bottom benthic organisms, right? We have our innkeeper worms, um, just like in the estuaries. We have uh, polychaetes, we have clams, we have brittle stars, sand dollars. Um, we have lots of different things that live in soft sandy bottom areas. So despite the fact that they kind of look barren, um, it's really only because a lot of these organisms are gonna be found buried deep in, um, like these guys here, or kind of like on the top, but very spread out. So there are still a lot of organisms there, but they're very spread out for the area, not like the crowded intertidal or even crowded kelp forest. Seagrass beds, we learned about seagrass beds already, but again, very important for nursery habitats. They need good clean water. Um, they need to be in some kind of shallow area, probably a little bit on the warmer side. Um, um, it really depends on the species of seagrass though, that uh, what their temperature and salinity and all of their ranges are, it just always depends on the species. You can have a general broad description of, of these seagrasses, but really it's going to depend on the actual species itself. Um, yeah, and either species will either enjoy the warmer waters, like the ones we have out here, or they are the colder water species and only enjoy the cold, but they don't go back and forth. So if you're in the cold, you like to stay in the cold. If you're in the warm, you like to stay in the warm when it comes to these um, seagrasses. So again, seagrass beds, look at all that complexity. You can see all these tiny little nooks and habitats. You can even see some fish. These look like blacksmiths, like swimming right above it. Um, this guy is a common predator of the seagrass beds. And again, he's not trying to kill the entire seagrass bed. He's not even trying to kill the entire seagrass plant. Um, he's just grazing. So just like our cows, right? They don't munch on everything. They don't need all the roots and kill the actual grass. They just pull off the top of these little blades here, these little leaves, and then the rest of it can grow so they can come back and graze again but very important ecosystems and food sources. Hard bottom substrates, again, are gonna be less common than the soft sandy bottoms, but they're very productive because you can have things like algae and other sessile organisms that need to actually attach themselves to the bottom um, that you're gonna get a little bit more um, increased species diversity um, because these different organisms can, can live in different ways. There are soft sandy bot um, bottoms around these hard rocky areas, and so you'll have the soft sandy animals with the hard bottom areas, with the, the predator species swimming around um, because there's increase in food. So you really do get a wide variety of different organisms in a complex community in these hard bottom areas. Um, oyster reefs are great. Those are also hard bottom areas. So even though your bottom is not hard, you're an artificial hard bottom. So those oyster reefs that we learned about last week, um, those are still considered hard bottom substrates, even though they're in an estuary, which is a soft bottom substrate. So again, a lot of the times you can have these areas that are kind of very close to each other and, um, and overlap. And that really does give you the best species diversity. You don't want all sand or all rock. You kind of want a combination of both, um, which is kind of what we see in the, the most uh, productive areas of the ocean. Terrible picture of a hard bottom. <laughs> I don't know why I didn't get a better one. Um, but you can see, again, you can see all that rugosity, all that complexity in this area. And there's actually a lot of organisms here, despite the fact that you really can't see them. There are still a lot of organisms in this picture. Kelp forest, very, very important for our California um, ecosystems, right? This is Macrocystis periphera, the giant kelp. Um, it is a brown algae. And again, anytime you're talking about algae, it could be brown or red or green. But when you're talking about kelp specifically, most people are talking about um, the brown algae like our giant kelp, the Macrocystis periphera. Um, they do need cold water, so unlike the seagrasses, it can live in either, or these guys just like it cold. So these big brown algaes do not like it warm, which is why you won't go to the tropics and see a big old kelp forest, but you will here in our cold California waters. 
Um, they are very, very fast growing. Some of these can grow up to 20 inches a day. 20 inches a day, that's almost two feet in a day, in a single day. So your plants, your algae started here, now it's here. The next day it's here, and the next day it's here, and the next day it's here. And that's because sometimes these, these guys do live in, you know, 50, 60 feet of water, and that's pretty deep for an algae. So they need to be able to grow nice and tall to be able to actually get up to that sunlight and create that canopy so that they can do all the photosynthesis they need, and then send that energy all the way down below where it's darker. Um, we already talked about Macrocystis, our good friend, the California giant kelp. Um, and again, they can grow up to, like I said, they're in 50, 60 feet of water, but even though they're in 50, 60 feet of water, they can still grow up and then canopy over. So their total length can be up to a hundred feet, hundred feet, right? And if they're growing 20 feet a day, it didn't really take them that long to get there. So even in these big storms and stuff, if most of your macrocystis kind of breaks off, you're still very fast growing. You can get up there and you can replace it. And that's very important because you need to be able to do the photosynthesis that you need to survive. And therefore you need to be able to grow really fast despite the fact that there was maybe some winter storm that just knocked off half your body. Um, yeah, these guys, these kelp forests are a major ecosystem. It's really, really productive and important for so many different species. Not just of fish and invertebrates and crabs and mollusks and stuff like that, but like mammals too. Um, they get their food source from here, otters, sea lions, stuff like that. Um, big, big food source for all of these different organisms in the ocean as well as, it's because they're providing so many different ecosystems and, and many habitats and little niches. Um, and that really allows them to, to thrive and to get increased, um, not only population densities, but species diversity as well, which is great. Sea urchins, guys, we've talked about this a couple times. Remember, sea urchins are the bane of the kelp forest existence. They're really bad news for the kelp forest. Our sea otters are supposed to keep the um, sea urchin population in check. Things like California sheephead, same thing. They're going to eat those urchins. If we remove both of them because of either fur trades or because of fishing, we now lose out on the, um, the predators of the sea urchins and therefore the kelp forest is just going to get decimated by these um, sea urchins. So they're just going to eat and eat and eat and eat, and then it's going to, especially because they're, they're really small, they eat along the bottom, and therefore they detach the hold fast. And then despite the fact that you're 100 feet long, you just got detached from your, your holding, and you, there's no reattaching, and then you're going to drift away, and then eventually you're going to die. And that kelp forest is going to be lost because of these sea urchins. So really, really important to keep these sea urchins around, sorry, to keep the predators of the sea urchins around so that the sea urchin population doesn't get out of control and therefore kill and eat our entire ecosystem. Here's what a big, beautiful, healthy kelp forest looks like. You can see all this 3D complexity here, all of these different species of fish in here. Um, what you can't see is there's all even more organisms that are living down in here, hiding in the blades, hiding amongst us, hiding in the holdfast. Really, really just complex um, environment and ecosystem creating a ton of rugosity, which can, can, makes a ton of little niches and little microhabitats, and therefore you can, you can sustain a bigger population of every different species um, present. So always a good thing to have big complex kelp forests like that. Not so good when they turn from these two down here into these two up here. Um, these are almost taken in the exact same spot. They're the, basically off of Catalina and stuff like that during... during um, years where these urchin barons have just come in and just eaten everything. Um, so there's a lot of different programs out there that are working to restore some of this. Um, and but basically what they do is they just come and they take up, they just pick up all the urchins and they just scoop them up, they put them in a bag and they drive way off our coast to those deep, deep water pockets that we talked about and just dump them. Just dump them. Obviously the urchin population is not hurting whatsoever. Nobody really eats these so we can't sell them commercially. This is not the type of uni that you might eat. If you were to go to a sushi place, it's not the time of urchin. Um, those are deep water urchins. I think those are pur those are white urchins. These are purple urchins. Um, anyway, it's a different species, and these these don't taste very good. So instead of just you know throwing in like a dumpster and making them useless, we just drop them to a different place of the ocean, and therefore someone in the ocean is going to be able to have a meal um, based on these little urchins. And way at the bottom of the ocean, there's no algae down there, so these guys would have no food. So they'd be able to survive for a while but eventually would die and then their nutrients would be recycled to somebody else. So not a terrible thing that they're removing these from big healthy kelp forests and then dumping them elsewhere offshore. So sometimes necessary. This is, um, this is kind of like, um, 
not landscaping for the ocean, but, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? <sighs> Essentially, you're terraforming. It's like you're, you're almost terraforming for the ocean. You're going in there and taking out what you don't want and, and making sure that it remains looking like this, nice and healthy, instead of looking like this, which is barren and completely almost dead. So, mm -hmm. sometimes it's necessary to kill some merchants to, to keep a nice, healthy ecosystem. Ah. <gasps> With that, I will leave you guys, and um, if you have any questions, let me know. Obviously, shoot me any emails. Otherwise, I hope you have a wonderful day, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Okay, bye.